get us in a sail portion then. Yeah. Shabbat Shalom. Amen. Shabbat Shalom. So we're in, we're in chapter 18 now. Chapter 18 tonight. Chapter 18. We left off last week. Didn't get loads of time on to finish off last week. But last week we finished off with Moshe sitting on a stone and Eben, which is a which is the Hebrew. It's got Av and Ben. So it's a picture of the father and the son as one. And Moshe was sitting on it, which is all a picture of Psalm 110, sit at my right hand. And all a picture of where we are right now, seated in the Messiah in heavenly places. Amen. And what did Moses have to do? Lift his hands. And when his hands got tied, his mates Aaron and he come and supported his hands. And it's with the psalm we read earlier from Psalm 134. Lift up your hands in the sanctuary and bless Jehovah. And that's not an Old Testament concept. It's what Paul says to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 2. He says, I desire that men lift up their hands everywhere and pray. So we've said this in the past, but lifting your hands is such a powerful expression of praise. Lift up our hands in the sanctuary. That's what you need to do. And I love when we all do it together, but you won't feel comfortable doing it publicly unless you can do it privately on your own. Amen. Amen. With no one else watching you. Get them hands up in here. Get them hands up in here because it's a powerful thing. It's a powerful thing. So I just wanted to mention that. I've missed it loads of times, it's something I do, and it's what King David said in Psalm 141, King David said, let the lifting of my hands be like the evening sacrifice, and that's what we are now, we're a kingdom of priests, we're a royal priesthood, and priests lift their hands as part of the priestly service, so I just want to encourage that, you know, in your own privacy, of your own bedroom with your door closed Hello. get your hands up and, and the other thing you might say <coughs> no shoes on in your no shoes on because you're not holding your hands amen amen, amen. Amen. Um, if we've got anything on our feet, it's what Ephesians says. We are our feet are shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. That's what we all want, Father. Get those gospel shoes on us, Lord. Help us to get them gospel shoes on and to proclaim the gospel. And even in prayer, Lord God, to be praying now for a grace outpouring of your spirit. Father, we're crying out to you, Hosanna, with hands lifted up, crying out for a great move. Amen. All right, can we just get on with it then now? Chapter 18, it's Jethro now, Yitro, Yitro in Hebrew, Jethro. Now, if you want a bit more of a study on this, last year's message is recorded, or two years ago, whatever it was, it's on our list of YouTube. And... Every year I get hijacked by this and Jethro just has me off and I end up talking about Jethro all night and I don't want to do that tonight. I'll, let's skip through it and there's plenty of info on a previous message about it. But we will read it. You know, let's read it, but I don't want to spend all night on it tonight. I want to get into the next bit. As I said, it's going to be very Zion tonight. Very Zion. It's Zion now, that's where we belong. So this is Jethro, Yitro, Yitro, chapter 18. So I'll just read it and just make comments as I go. But all I want to alert you to is this fella is such a hero to so many people, but not to me, not to me. And when we started this a few years ago, and I first shared this, and when I was studying in the week, I just couldn't shake it. I was like, I'm not having it. This Jethro is not so good at all. He's not so good. And I told him my notes for that, that, that week. I said, Yitro, friend or foe? Yitro, friend or foe? I don't know, everyone wasn't quite sure where I was coming from. And then, by the end of the night, I think people were pretty much agreeing. Oh yeah, I haven't seen it that way before. Because everyone thinks he's some great counsellor, gives Moses this great advice. It's just not the case at all. And then, Sonia had put us in touch with Bill Bullock, if you remember. And this, so Sonia mentioned this guy called Bill Bullock. Quite a few of us have read his portions now. So when I come round to the next year, and it was this portion, and I was studying Bill Bullock's notes, Bill Bullock had copied my notes. 
<laughs> well, maybe he hadn't copied my notes. <laughs> but Bill Phillips, the title of his, of his message was Yitzro, Friends or Four. Yeah. And I was like, there's not many people who are going to confirm and back this up, but if you want anyone backing it up, Bill Bullock's the man, because he's great, Bill Bullock. Yeah. And he said the same things, yet so friends or fun. He's not what you, he, he seems to be, this character. I will give him a bit more credit than I normally do, and I will say that I believe he becomes a believer. I do believe that, but it's like the Bible says, don't put young believers into places of authority. They'll get puffed up and you'll get shipwrecked. Yeah. And yet, yet so is an example of this. He might be a, a wise Midianite and all the rest of it, but, and he might become a believer, I think he does, but he soon hijacks the whole show. Yeah. And that's what you'll see. And, well, that's, that's interesting, that's interesting. And it just so happens that it's right before chapter 19 and right before we arrive at Sinai and Yitzro is here to put us off the scent and to take our attention away from what is really going on here. And so I don't want to give Yitzro that opportunity tonight. I might give him 10 minutes or so. <laughs> verse in chapter 18, verse 1. <laughs> and Yitzro, Yitzro, the priest of Midian, now, we've said this before, but it's very clear in Hebrew, Yitzro, priest, can be priest, it can also mean ruler, or like, you know, you've got to understand where this is, this is in Arabia, so it's like he's a Saudi Arabian character, so he's more like a sheik, he might have priestly tendencies, but it just means ruler. Ruler and in Hebrew, Midian means strife. I mean, that's just what it means. So, this character is the ruler, the sheikh, the priest of strife, and that's what strife's like. It comes in very subtly, even between brothers and sisters. When strife comes, all manner of evil, it says, comes with it. So, we've got to be aware of strife. Yitzro is the priest of Midian, strife. That's who he is. Moshe's. Father-in-law heard all that God had done for Moshe and for Israel, his people, that Yahuwah had brought Israel out of Egypt. Then Yitro, Moshe's father-in-law, and we'll see this throughout this first chapter, and this is the book of Shemot, Exodus is Shemot, the book of names, and so you pay attention to names and you see that Yitro's name is mentioned far less than his title of Moses' father-in-law. And soon, in the night of Yitzhak's name, just gets omitted altogether, and it's all Moshe's father-in-law, Moshe's father-in-law. And that's what started to alert me. And he, start, he uses the name Yah, and then it all gets dropped in favour of God. <coughs> and these things alert me, alerted me. This is when I was starting to fall in love with the name of the Creator. And so I was very sensitive to it, and I was going, I don't feel comfortable with this lad. And then the more I examined it, the more I went, no, I'm not having this character. We only have to look at where this ends up in a few years' time. It's the Midianites that come out and seduce Israel. This is Jethro's people. Yes, right. Jethro's people are the people that come out and seduce Israel and 24,000 die in one day. Why? Because they seduced them into the worship of, who is it? Remember Baal Peor. Remember the instance of that Baal Peor. That's who the Midianites worship. That's who Jethro is a priest of. They worship that sort of God. Disgusting gods like Baal Peor. If you remember that God, he has like, he's a goddess, he's always a statue or whatever, with a big open pit in front of him. Mm. And people would use it as an open toilet. And now you can understand why the devil is also called Bial yeah. yeah. the Lord of the Flies. Because you get a lot of flies and all those open latrines, yeah. don't you? Well, that's what that God's about. And that's what this people, that's who they worship. So when you see Jethro is a priest of Midian, don't be taken in by him. Midianites, you know, they have false gods. They, just, they came to destroy Israel. And don't forget as well where Midian comes from. Midian is one of the Abrahamic children. He was, a, he was the son of Abraham's Ketubah, eh, Ketorah, Ketorah. Yeah, his concubine or whatever yeah. and he sent them away to, he sent all of his concubine children away and said only Isaac's getting all the blessing <laughs> so you know that this family's got a little bit of a chip on its shoulder when it comes to Israel 
So that's just the background. First two, then Jethro, Moshe's father-in-law, took Zipporah, Moshe's wife, after he had sent her back, sent her back, is the same phrase in Hebrew for divorce. It's like Moshe had divorced Zipporah. They had separated. Do you remember at the incident when she circumcised the son and threw the foreskin at Moshe's feet and said, you are a husband of blood to me? Well, and I said at that point, it looks like Moshe sent her home now. And he was never supposed to have took her in the first place, I don't think. No. It, wasn't, it wasn't a job for the family, this. This was a go to Vero and tell him there's going to be all kinds. And maybe it wasn't wise to take the wife and kids for a little holiday. So when she ended up getting sent home, now most Joe Jethro turns up with his, with his wife and his two sons. There's three, one of whose name is Gershaw. For he said, I have been a stranger in a foreign land. And the name of the other was Eliezer. For he said, the God of my father was my God. And delivered me from the sword of Pharaoh. And Jethro, Yitro, Moshe's father-in-law, came with his sons and his wife to Moshe in the wilderness, where he was encamped at the mountain of God. Now he had said to Moshe, I, your father-in-law, Yitro, am come to you with your wife and your two sons with her. So Moshe went out to meet his father-in-law, bowed down and kissed him and they asked each other about their well-being in other words in hebrew they said shalom to each other that's what it says in hebrew they went shalom shalom that's just very english they asked each other about their well-being and they went into the tent and moshe told his father-in-law all that yahovah had done to pharaoh and to the egyptians for israel's sake all the hardship that had come upon them on the way and how Yah had delivered them. I mean, what a story that must have been. Imagine sitting down and getting sort of going through all this, the part at the Red Sea, etc. You know, all what we went through last week, the Song of Moses, the bitter waters being turned into sweet waters, oh, the manna from heaven. He's telling Yitzhak all about this. Verse 9, so Yitzhak rejoiced. For all the good which Yah had done for Israel, whom he had delivered out of the hands of the Egyptians. And Yitro said, Blessed be Yahweh, who has delivered you out of the hands of the Egyptians and out of the hands of Pharaoh, and who has delivered the people from under the hands of the Egyptians. Now I know that Yahweh is greater than all the gods. For in the very thing in which they behaved proudly, he was above them. So it's all looking good. Yitzhak's looking good. He's believing in Yah now. And I would give him credit and say, at this point, I would th- imagine you would have to say he's a believer. Yeah. He believes Yah is greater than all the gods. But that's just the start. You know, coming into this thing, it's just the start. We can all be believers. We can all be baby believers. But we need to grow and mature. That's right. yeah. And that's where Yitzhak stops. The good news stops now with Yitzhak. You'll see now. So he's given a great testimony. I know now that Yah. So we, I'm saying you can only do this with hindsight, but in, with hindsight, you know, Yitro leaves the camp of Israel. He decides to go back to his people. And in a few years, we'll see the Midianites, as I've already mentioned, come out to worship their false god and to seduce Israel. And Yitro's meant to be the leader. So what happened, Yitro? Shouldn't he have brought his people into this covenant? Shouldn't he have gone to proclaim the good news to his people and said, you know what, we need to join these Israelites and worship their God. That's not what happens, you see. That's not what happens. Verse verse 12, say goodbye to Yitzro now. This is the last time you'll see his name. Then Yitzro, Moshe's father-in-law, oh yeah, took a burnt offering and other sacrifices to offer to God. What were they? Probably Easter eggs and all that. And Aaron came with all the elders of Israel to eat bread with Moshe's father-in-law before God. Where's Moshe? Moshe's not there. Moshe doesn't join in this feast, this man-made feast. <coughs> so he's just carrying on with himself now, thinking, Ah, oh, I'm a priest, I'm the ruler of Israel, so I'll show you now how to do sacrifices. Moshe said to Pharaoh the other week, no, eh, no fear, we've got to take all the cattle because God hasn't shown us yet how he wants us to worship him. He hasn't instituted any system of sacrificial animals yet and shown us anything. Jethro has. Jethro knows. It's like when Balaam turns up in Numbers 24 and he's there, 
on the mountains going, oh, bring me seven bowls and seven lambs, and uh, it's all sevens, and it's all got this appearance of godliness. But it's just pagan, idolatry. It's interesting, Stephen, that you name it, and it's too, too deep, excess and superiority. And there you go. That's who he thinks it is. That's called superiority, John is saying. Yeah, excess of superiority. Yitro. That's what Jethro. Yitro in Hebrew. Yitro. Jethro. But as I said, his name goes now. Bye bye, Jethro. It's all going to be Moshe's father in law now. So I'm not going to spend too much time on this. You know, I've made my points and it's already on a previous recording. So I want to read the narrative. Verse 13, so he's doing all these sacrifices and burnt offerings and it looks very spiritual. Verse 13, and so it was on the next day that Moshe sat to judge the people and the people stood before Moshe from morning till evening. So when Moshe's father-in-law saw that all he did for the people, he said, what is this thing you were doing for the people? Why do you alone sit? And all the people stand before you from morning till evening. And Moses said to his father in law, Because the people come to me to inquire of God. When they have a difficulty, they come to me, and I judge between one and another, and I make known the statutes of God and his Torah. What's wrong with that? So Moses' father in law, no Jethro anymore, said to him, The thing that you do is not good. Why? You know, it reminds me of. When Yeshua was ministering and he was healing all the multitudes, imagine small coming to him and going, Oh, that's not good what you're doing. You can't do all this yourself. It's like, why? Why? Why can't you do this? Who are you, Yitzhak? Why are you imposing your opinions on what God's doing here? God's chose Moshe. God's put Moshe in charge of this. Moshe knows what to teach the people. Why are you interfering, Yitzhak? Verse 18. So, you, verse 17, what you'll do is not good. Both you and these people who are with you will surely wear yourselves out. But this thing is too much for you. You're not able to form it by yourself. It sounds wise. So everyone thinks he's a great counsellor, Yitro. Great counsellor. Well, he's just interfering. It's none of his business. Verse 19, listen now to my voice. I will give you counsel and God will be with you. Stand before God. This is not the attitude. You bow before God. But Moshe was doing it the other way around before. He was bowing to Yitro. And you can see why he's been with Yitro for 40 years. Yitro took him in when he'd left Egypt. This is a soul type. Moshe's very attached to Yitro. He respects him and all that. And but Yitro's taken advantage of his police. Stand before God for the people so that you may bring the difficulties to God and you shall teach them the statutes and the laws which, and show them the way in which they must walk and the work they must do. Moreover, you shall select from the people able men such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness and place such over them to be rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties and rulers of tens. I'm not going to go there now but when we get to Numbers 31, when God says to Moshe, go and take vengeance on the Midianites. And it's the captains of hundreds and the captains of thousands that are appointed to go and destroy the Midianites. So this plan of Jethro will come back to haunt him in years to come. This is a man-made system. We only have to look further on when well, it does get a bit too much for Moshe. And then that's when God says to him, right, get 70 people. And I will take up the spirit that's upon you, Moses. And I will put it on them. That was God's plan. 70, 70. Take 70 people. And I will, I will anoint them with the same anointing you've got, Moses. That was God's plan. This is man's plan. It's a Nicolaitan structure. It says this in Revelation twice. Yeshua says, I hate the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Nicolaitans, Nicol, Nike in Greek, to rule over, to conquer. Laetan, the laity, to lord and over the laity. These positions of power, these senior pastors, and all of these man made titles. It's all the same Nicolaitan structure. The flesh loves it and gravitates towards it and Yitzhak is just deceptive
descended here from that beautiful place where he acknowledged that Yahweh was greater than all the gods. But now he's doing it man's way. The way he's always done it. And that is the thing, isn't it? The flesh will always want to go after a man-made structure. It's just horrible. And it, it's deceived by these things. Yeshua hates the nickelated structure. There's no layers. But one. One. So, but it sounds on the face of it, you could understand why for years people have thought that this is a great character. But I'll leave the rest for you and say more information as previously been given. Verse 22. Let them judge the people at all times. Then it shall be every great matter they shall bring to you. But every small matter they themselves shall judge. So it will be easier for you. For they will bear the burden with you. If you do this thing and God so commands you. Wow. I mean, this I... Ooh, unless God has really commanded this, what's going on here? And I don't believe God has commanded it. As I've just said, God's got his way that he'll deal with in time to come. But God commands you, then you will be able to endure. And all these people will also go to their place in peace. Well, we know that doesn't happen, don't we? <laughs> we know that's not going to happen because this generation's got it all dying in the wilderness. So we know that this prophecy from Jethro doesn't come to pass. It doesn't. Verse 24, so Moshe shamed the voice of his father-in-law and did all that he said. That, that, that should only ever be applied to God. <laughs> Moshe and the people shamed all that God said and did all he said. This is not good language. Moses did it. Moses did that. It was his choice. Oh yeah, I agree with you, John. No, no, no. That's why I'm saying we've got to be on our toes here. And like we said last week, First Corinthians chapter 10, all of this happened, and all of this was written down. Who for? For you, upon whom the end of the ages has come. I mean, Moses messed up a few. He said, speak in things. He struck the rock when he said, speak. Of course. See what I'm saying? Yes. And verse 25, Moses chose able men out of all Israel and made them heads over the people, rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, rulers of tens. As you're saying, John, he done exactly what Jethro said. So they judged the people at all times, the hard cases they brought to Moses, but every, they judged every small case themselves. Then Moshe let his father-in-law depart, and he went his way to his own land. That's not the way it should have been. You're meant to be getting grafted into this nation. You're meant to be understanding. The God of Israel is the only true God. And join them. Get on board. Come on, get grafted in, Jethro. Come and join us. But he goes back to his own land. And history will show us, as I've said a couple of times, how these Midianites will carry on with themselves and what they will do. He doesn't go back to his own people and introduce them to the God, Yehovah, no. because they continue to worship false gods, as the narrative of Torah will prove. Will prove. All right, so that's not bad. We've got over Jethro now. That was so bad, John. So we weren't going to give him much space tonight. So see you, Jethro. <laughs> Chapter 19. <laughs> this is where we want to be now. Chapter 19. And as I've been saying, all right, this is about Zion. We're going to be going to Mount Sinai, but really the Holy Spirit wants to lead us to Mount Zion. That's what he wants to do. And we're going to get into that tonight. So I want to read more than normally out of the New Testament a lot tonight. A lot of times we have ref referenced, oh, no, Galatians 4, Hebrews 12, but tonight I want to spend the time and read them scriptures together spend time and read them together because there's only two chapters to go so we're a short one tonight chapter 19 chapter 20 on the door so let's get into the narrative and then let's revisit it if i get carried away just have to excuse me because i get carried away with this one time. chapter 19 in the third month in the third month when did we come out of his egypt in the first month wasn't it on the 15th day of the month they had the Passover meal, and then they left Egypt, didn't they, after midnight when all the firstborn died. So this is the third month, and as I said last week, and as I will say again now, this period of time from when we came out of Egypt, in Exodus chapter 12, right through this portion, right through next week's portion, is what's known as the days of the counting of the Omer, a 50-day period from when they left Egypt, 
So when they came to Sinai, this now is Shavuot. This is the Feast of Pentecost. It's the Feast of Shavuot, the Feast of Weeks, where we count for seven sets of seven, which is 49. And we count the Omer for 49 days. And it's to remember this journey. So when we get there, it's all to remind us of this journey and to really meditate on this, these few chapters. Really meditate on them. Really get to this place tonight. Chapter 19, in the third month, the month of Shavuot, 50 days. After the children of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on the same day they came to the wilderness of Sinai. For they had departed from Revadim, had come to the wilderness of Sinai, and camped in the wilderness. So Israel camped there before the mountain. And Moshe went up to God, and Yehovah called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Yahoth, and tell the children of Israel, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings, and brought you to myself. Isn't that beautiful? I bore you on eagles' wings, and brought you to myself. This is like Revelation chapter 13. This it says in Revelation chapter 13 that the wings of a great eagle are given to the woman, and she is flees to a place that's being prepared for her in the wilderness. This is Revelation future chapter 13, drawing on the same narrative of how God brought Israel out of Egypt. It's the same God. It's the same story. Rise upon wings like wings eagles. Like eagles. Amen. Amen. He is the wind beneath our wings. Amen. That's it. The wind is the ruach. So these eagles' wings, it is another picture of the Spirit of God. Because it was the Spirit of God that blew and parted the Red Sea, wasn't it? And the east wind that brought in the uh, quails and all the rest of it, you know. So I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now therefore, if, if, if you will indeed shima, shima my voice and shome, shome with the R at the end, like shema, yeah. keep, keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure. This is what Lynn always gets mixed up with. It's an Am Segura, isn't it? Am Segura. Am Segura. But Lynn always calls it a Ham Segura. <laughs> am Segura is, am is people and Segura treasure. My okay, special yeah. treasure. Special treasure. And it's, it's, it's a reference to a treasure so special that only the king could touch it. It was, it was his treasure. It was only for him to hold special treasure if you will hear my voice and keep my covenant you will be an answer a special treasure to me above all for all the earth is mine and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests kingdom of priests and a holy nation these are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. So I might as well just read it now, just for the reference. You've heard it loads of time. But it's in 1 Peter, just so you can understand this, what's getting said. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9 says, You are a chosen generation. You are a royal priesthood. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. You are a chosen generation. You are a royal priesthood. You are the holy nation. His own special people. And Segura, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvellous light. Who once were not a people, but now the pe- you are now the people of God. Who have not obtained mercy, but now you have obtained mercy. So that's just what Peter tells us, that now in this new covenant, now all of those of us who are in the Messiah, we are in fact the royal priesthood now. We are that holy nation and we are that special treasure. All what God said to Israel back then, 
is true of us now. It's still being fulfilled. Amen. Amen. It is. We need to mature and grow and understand what a kingdom of peace looks like. But what is this covenant? Well, how do we behave? How do we live? What do we do? That's why we meet on the Sabbath. That's why we keep the feasts. Because we're coming back to this understanding that this is our God and he has not changed in any way and his voice has not changed at all. So that's what we're trying to learn as we go. You know, and I, we're not, you know, where are we learning? We're not getting, none of us are perfect. None of us are fully perfect and fully understanding this completely. Which was asking for wisdom. We're asking for understanding and that we would just grow and brighter and brighter and to the full day. That's how this walk is. But I just believe that there's great rewards for people that are keeping his feasts and keeping his Torah. There's great rewards for this. So verse 7, Moshe came and called for the elders of the people and laid before them all these words which Yahovah had commanded him. Then all the people answered together and said, All that Yahovah has said, we will do. <coughs> we, don't, we don't know what it is yet. We haven't got a clue what he's actually going to ask us to do. No. But we'll do it anyway. <laughs> this is what you would call presumption. Yeah. This is called presumption. Yeah. It's not even, as we'll see in time to come, that I the right system or what's the right I'm looking for but God says first of all you must shema what I've got to say then you must shame keep it guard it meditate on it then you will be empowered to do it don't just presume you can do these things there see that was verse 9 you okay all right yeah just bless Mary and father with this chest. <coughs> father you know Please just take away this sickness, this disease. Heal this in the name of Yeshua, Father. Just ask for the healing, Father, for Mary, for this chest complaint, Father. Amen. The power of Your presence here, as John saying, we're commanding it. You understand this? Command in the name of Yeshua, healing. Amen. Sorry, sorry, to, just wanted to. Pray. Verse 8, verse 9. And Yahuwah said to Moshe, Behold, I come to you in the thick cloud, that the people may hear where I speak with you, and believe you forever. So Moshe told the words of the people to Yahuwah. So Moshe told the words of the people to Yahuwah. In other words, yeah, the people said, All that you say, they will do. Then Yah said to Moshe, Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow. And let them wash the clothes. I mean, is it, you know, by all accounts, there's over a couple of million people here in the wilderness. <laughs> so it's not like they're going down to the bag wash, no. do you know what I mean, to wash the clothes. No, but they needed a bit of a wash, you know what I'm saying? You've had, you've had a good 40, 50 days here in the wilderness. Jesus is going to come back in the clouds as well. Yeah, Greece. Grace, Grace, that we should mention so more about that. He said, I'll come back to you in the same way. Amen. Did you hear what Mary said there? Right. Yeshua ascended to heaven on the clouds, and the angel said, He is going to come back in like right. manner. And we see that, don't we, that He's come, going to come as one seated on a cloud. This is what Daniel seen, wasn't it? He saw one like the Son of Man on the clouds. So that's a good point. This is very messianic, this. Yeah. Then Yahuwah said to me, it's now verse 11, let them be ready for the third day. For on the third day, Yahuwah will come down upon Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. You shall set bounds to the people all around, saying, take heed to yourselves that you do not go up to the mountain or touch its base. Whoever touches the mountain shall surely be put to death. Not a hand shall touch him, but he shall surely be stoned or shot with an arrow. Where the man or beast he shall not live. When the shofar sounds strong, they shall come near the mountain. So when Moshe went down from the mountain to the people and sanctified the people, and they washed their clothes, and he said to the people, Be ready for the third day. 
Do not come near your wives. Then it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunderings and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain and the sound of the shofar was very loud in Hebrew Kazakh. It was very strong. Your shofar is very strong, there, they? Right? It's got a real strong tone on that one. It's beautiful, isn't it? The sound of the shofar always is to take us back to Genesis chapter 22. The Achede is what they call it, isn't it? The Achede, where Isaac was going to be offered up as a sacrifice. And God said, don't do it, Abraham. And he provided a ram that was caused in its thick, in the thickets by its horn. It's horn, and so the ram's horn, and when we sound the ram's horn, it's always about that. It's an Abrahamic um, event. When we sound the shofar, we are remembering Abraham and Isaac, and the fact that God said, I will provide myself the lamb. That's what the show is about. And we'll be one when it comes back as well. Well, there's another good point because this is actually the first mention in Scripture of the shofar. First mention of the word shofar in Scripture is here. And so, if you want to know what the last trumpet is, it's good to know what the first trumpet is. <laughs> and this is the first trumpet. The first trumpet is not in the book of Revelation when the angel sounds his trumpet. This is the first shofar mentioned. This is the first shofar blast. So the, the last shofar will have a lot to do with this. So it came to pass on the third day that all the thunder and lightnings. You've got to get into this now. And the sound of the shofar was strong, Kazakh. So all the people who were in the camp trembled. They were all trembling. And they're not the only one. The mountain's going to be trembling in a minute. And Moshe brought the people out of the camp to meet with God. And they stood at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was completely in smoke. Because Yahweh descended upon it in fire. Its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace. And the whole mountain quaked greatly. The whole mountain, whole of the mountain is quaking tremble and the people are trembling i'm saying all this because when we get to hebrews 12 in a minute this is the imagery you need to understand when when whoever wrote hebrews is saying that there is going to come again a great shaking so that the things that can be shaken will be shaken and the things that can't be shaken will remain and i think it been like being at the bottom of the mountain of a volcano yeah Oh, I think it's going to, it's terrifying. It says the Lord's trembling. Yeah. What an experience this is. Moshe's got the courage to face it and go up to it. The others, they're all trembling. They haven't got, they haven't, they've, they've got no courage here. This is, this day now is, it is a disaster this day. And I will say this, it's an absolute disaster. What happens here today? It's deep. Mm-hmm. What did you say about the third, the, the mention, the first mention that was the trumpet, the trumpet, the trumpet was there. Yeah. You know, uh, the first, the first sound of show for the people were scattered, and the second, the, the last show the people were brought back. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, 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 yes. See what we had, we've had, you know, that Psalm 125 was trying to get out tonight, wasn't it? Yvonne started to bring it, then did you mention it, Marion? And then mm. when Mike just read it, it's like, let's just have it. Well, look at what it says in Psalm 125. Those who trust in Yehovah, those who trust in Yehovah, are like Mount Zion, which cannot be moved, but abides forever. Yeah. Mount Zion's not like Mount Sinai. Mount Zion's not trembling. Yeah. Mount Zion's solid. Yeah. Mount Zion's steadfast. Yeah. Those who trust in Jehovah will be like Mount Zion, steadfast, not trembling, not in fear, not quaking, solid like Mount Zion. Rock solid. Rock solid. Well, this mountain's made of rock, but it's not rock solid. It's trembling. And if you've looked at any of them videos, <coughs> on one of them you'll have seen Mount Sinai, the real Mount Sinai. It's you know the real one, not Constantine's mum's version, but the real Mount Sinai. And you can see it with the naked eye that it's black at the top. 
the rest of it's like the rest of Sinai, uh, the rest of that area, all like red, smoky mountains. But this one's black at the top, at the top. burnt, and we've analysed it, and we've gone on yeah, This rock was actually burnt. Yeah. It was burnt because Yah actually descended on it like fire. That's right. And we didn't mention it last week, Mike, but remember that other thing we watched on the other side of the Sinai, the other side of the Red Sea, where the pillar of fire was. To this day, you can go there. And the sand has been melted. Yeah. It's not rock. It's like melted sand. It's a, it's a geological yeah. anomaly where it's like, it doesn't look normal. It's like lava flow. When lava flows and then it's, it, it solidifies and it's all, you can see it's been a river at one side. Well, the sand on the side, on the shores of the Gulf of Aqaba, I like that in places where there's a real pillar of fire, fire that melted the sand. And I'm amazing to see it. Moment. It becomes official like, when you, when you, when you get stupid. It's amazing. And Sinai is there to this day as a testimony to these things. This event happened. It's still, it's, it's still a kind of joke. Yeah. That's right, first 19. And then when the blast of the trumpet sounded strong and became stronger and stronger, Moshe spoke and God answered him. By voice. Then Yehovah came down upon Mount Sinai on the top of the mountain, and Yehovah called Moshe to the top of the mountain, and Moshe went up. Brave Moshe. He's already heard the voice of God, Moshe has him. It was at this very mountain that God first appeared to Moshe, wasn't it? In a burning bush. And spoke to him from the midst of the burning bush. And he said to him, This will be a sign to you, Moshe, when you come back to this mountain. When you come back to this mountain and worship me, this will be a sign to you. And Moshe's back at his mountain. He's like, Wow, this is amazing. Moshe's got the courage to go up. The other people are trembling, trembling. And Yahuwah in verse 21 said to Moshe, Moshe just gone up. And I'm not being funny, it's not just some hill. It's the biggest mountain in this area of Arabia. It's like it's a hike. Yeah. It's, it's like just going for a walk. It's a massive mountain. And Moshe's easy. And he's just gone up to the top of the mountain. And now Yah says to him, Go down. Go down of all the people. Lest they break through to gaze at Yahuwah. And many of them perish. Also let the priests who come here Yah, consecrate themselves. Lest Yahuwah break out against them. But Moshe doesn't fancy going down again. And Moshe says to Yah, eh, the people cannot come to Mount Sinai, for you already have warned us, saying, set bounds around the mountain and can consecrate it. You know, in other words, yeah, we have done all that. It's sad that they won't be coming anywhere near the mountain. We've already set up a bounds. Yah says to him, verse 24, away, get down, and then come up, you and Aaron with you. But do not let the priests and the people break through to come up to Yahweh, lest he break out against them. So Moshe went down to the people and spoke to them. Amen. Now you've only got one chapter to go, so we're all right. We've got half an hour to go. I want to just wonder where we should. Let's just carry on and then we'll get into our Galatians and all that. Let's just read the rest of this. So a little pause. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you for this narrative, Father. Please give us wisdom and understanding. Please, Father, this event, we know it's a historical event, but we know right now what you're about to say. Your name, Yehovah, means that you were, you are, and you will be. So we know that although this is history, this is right now bang up to date. And this is future. So please, Father, help us all now to have ears to hear. If there's any inability in us to, to not hear, then please heal us of it. Please give us heart to hear. Heal us of hardness of heart and give us pure, clean hearts. Amen. Because this is, we say this a lot here, don't we? You've quoted this one as well, Psalm 95, quite a bit. Psalm 95 says, doesn't it? Today, 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 if you hear his voice, do not be like them and don't harden your heart like they did this is all an example to us and all i want to do for the rest of this night now is speak these words and then get into the new testament 
which will prove to us that these words and this covenant is for us. Not done away with, not nailed to the cross, not, not, not this covenant, not, not these words of the God who is the same yesterday, today and forever. And Hebrews will make this clear to us. And we'll probably next week or in future get more into Hebrews chapters 3 and 4. But if you would just read Hebrews chapters 3 and 4 yourself, you will see Psalm 95 getting referred to on a number of occasions in chapters 3 and 4 of Hebrews. And it's all leading to the place where it says that the word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword and able to divide between soul and spirit. This is what, it's, it's this word of God it's talking about. When you read the context of Hebrews 3 and 4, it's talking about this event and the fact that they did not have faith and they had hard hearts because of unbelief and it did not profit them and these people perished in the wilderness. And so therefore, for you now, don't let that be the case for you. No. Strive to enter this rest of saying. It's all in this context, so I'll leave that to you, Hebrews 3 and 4. Chapter 20. Chapter 20. Now this is interesting. You know, some people here might have been Catholics, I don't know. And some people here might have been Anglicans. Well, if you're a Catholic or an Anglican, you've had the wrong Ten Commandments given to you. Because neither the Catholic or the Church of England commandments have the first commandment. <laughs> they haven't got them. The Catholic version of the commandments is, the first one is, I, the Lord your God, you shall have no other gods besides me. That's the Catholic's first one. The, the Protestant first one is, you shall have no other gods but me. The Hebrew and the real biblical version is this, and God spoke all these words to Moshe, saying, I am Yahovah, your Elohim, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. It's like the church have tried to disconnect us from our Hebrew roots and tried to disconnect us from this story to make out that the church was born in Acts. Yeah. It's like what a load of nonsense. I mean, don't get me wrong, the church, the, the assembly was filled with the spirit of Acts. Yeah. You know, when they were filled with the spirit, Maybe what these people could have experienced, if they would have listened, could have happened to them. But in Acts, this is, the church wasn't invented. It, the church was filled with the spirit, but it wasn't invented, mm. was it? Because this is the assignment in the wilderness, right here, right now. And this first commandment, or first word, these aren't really ten commandments. They are the ten words, it says, doesn't it, in Hebrew, the divarot. The words, the words, the words. It's not a commandment, is it? I am Yahovah, your Elohim. But the point of this is, is this has got to be each and every person's experience. Each and every person has to hear this for themselves. Face to face, God saying, I am your God. And I am your God. And I am your God. And yours and every one of you. I am your God who brought you out of Egypt or out of darkness, as Peter put it, didn't he? Peter said, he's brought us out of darkness into his marvelous light. So this is that message that each person needs to understand that I am Yahovah, your Elohim. And Yahovah means I was. I was before the foundations of the world I chose you. The Lamb's Book of Life, slain from before the foundations of the world. When you were in your mother's womb, I knew you. I always have been your God. And I am that. I am your God. And I will always be your God. I will never leave you or forsake you. No one can take you out of my hand. This is the gospel we need to believe in. And this is the first of the words to establish. Personally, I am your God. And I always will be your God. So you can have a quick revelation on that one, just very brief. You know what he said? I will be saying, I am Yahweh, your creator. 
as well. Yeah. Ah, yeah. I am Yahweh. Yeah. But you yeah. say, Shema, your creator. Yeah. And if you get a revelation that he's your creator, you won't want any other Yahweh. Yeah. Amen. That's what he's. Well, that's why he's saying next, isn't it? In verse three, you shall have no other gods before me. Because there isn't any gods. Yeah, he's proven that. Hasn't he? He's just proven that to Israel it's by God by destroying the whole pantheon of Egyptian false gods. He's just destroyed them all, yeah. and he's made it clear. But and that's why for us now, all these years later, that's why this is so important to us that we relate to this story. Mm. You know, we need to understand that this is our story. At the Passover meal, in, in the way the Jews do it, the Haggads are, we are encouraged there. Everyone needs to know that they were part of this journey. We were, we were in the loins of our fathers going through the Red Sea. And it has to be a personal journey. And all of this, as Moses, as Paul said, it's all in for your instruction, all this. So uh, th that's the first. And in the Hebrew scriptures, it's so easy to identify because they have an RF next to this. Yeah. RF indicating this is the first commandment. And then at the second one, there'll be a bait to say number two. That's how it works. So it's so easily identified in the Hebrew scriptures what the numbers of these commandments are or these words are, these thoughts. It's like Yeshua said, out the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Well, this is the abundance of God's heart here. This is the abundance of God's heart pouring forth his words. You know, this is the God who said, let there be light, and there was light. And this is the God who is speaking his creative words into us, saying, look, I'm your God. Don't have any other gods before me. It's like this, will, this is prophetic empowerment, this. If you will hear these words, it will change us. It will make us more in his image it will bring us more into the glory to glory walk that we're meant to be in here we're meant to be the shema people of god and shema in his voice will have awesome impact on our lives it will it'll make us bow to him we'll just submit it will win us it will win our hearts and it will win our minds if we will hear it and that's the battle here. Will we hear it or not? And a lot of us have come out of a lot of tradition where we've been told, now we don't have to listen to this. This has all been nailed to the cross. What's that mean? What a load of nonsense. But these are the lies that we have inherited from our fathers. This is what Daniel chapter 7 said, wasn't it? Daniel chapter 7, we talking about the Antichrist. He will seek to take away the times mm. and the Torah. This is the Antichrist plan is to take away the Torah and take away the appointed times of God and replace them with a load of pagan nonsense. And this is what Paul said, the end days, there will be a people who will proclaim to be faithful, but they will actually deny the power of this. They'll hold to a form of godliness, just like Jethro, it sounds all godly, but it's not the faith, it's not the covenant. It's not this covenant. You only have to break it in one area and you broke the lot James says and Satan knows this you know the one he's attacked more than any other I would say is the Sabbath you know it's the one that's been attacked the one that's been taken away from us as Christians and being replaced with the first day of the week that's such an attack on this covenant such an attack on this covenant let's carry on verse 3 you shall have no other gods before me the Catholics don't have this one. That's, that's why they take away the first. I think I had it when I was in, in school. Which? I, I'm the Egypt. Maybe it was Yeah, they take off the Egypt bit, that's what I was saying. But they didn't take it out when I was there. Oh, they had the Egypt bit in? Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah. all right, so I'm just going off what I've got here. Yeah, what this is. Uh, yeah. yeah. All right, so they're getting a bad rap. They're getting a bad rap. What? I don't know. What, what the ad took out is the, this bit, verse 4, that you shall not make for yourself a carved image. That's what they haven't got in theirs, because obviously the Catholic Church is full of carved images, isn't it? Full of images. So you shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them, nor save them. 
Now, of course, this is exactly what's going to happen in about 40 days time, isn't it? In about 40 days time, and God knows all this, the children of Israel are going to be crying out for God. And our own is going to sculpt one for them, isn't it? And it's going to be called the golden calf. And so the very, very thing that they've been told clearly not to do, they do, because they don't hear his voice now. I need to crack on here. So, you shall not bow down to them nor save them, for I am Yahweh, your God. I'm a jealous God. Jealous. Jealous is good. Jealousy is good. Envy is bad. Envy is bad. Envy means you want something that belongs to someone else that's not yours. Jealousy means you want what is yours. And that's why God's a jealous God, because we are his. He has paid for us with his own blood, and he has got every right to be jealous about us, and every right to demand, they're mine, worship me the way I say. Don't worship false gods. Don't bow down to false gods that can't even hear and can't even speak. What are you doing with them? The pointless. Worship me. And worship me the way I tell you to. That's fair, isn't it? He is God at the end of the day. You know, I visit the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but show mercy to thousands to those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of Yahweh your Elohim in vain, but Yahweh will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. My understanding of that is when we're told about making oaths that if you make an oath in the name of Yah and you're lying, then you really are taking his name in vain. You know, because an oath was designed to put an end to all disputes. Take an oath, and that's the end of a matter. And so if you are stupid enough to take an oath and be lying about it, then that's between you and the one whose name you just talk in vain. Six, no, sorry, verse eight. Remember the Sabbath day. Remember the Sabbath day. Remember, we know that word in Hebrew means what it says. It means remember is an active doing verb word, isn't it? It means to do something about it. It doesn't just mean to be passive and go, ah, oh, remember the Sabbath. Lovely. It means to engage, do something about this. And we say it every week, but it's a lot of people get stuck in the, you can't do that, you can't do that. Oh, I did that. It's not about that. There is things that we're not meant to do. But if you don't know what you're supposed to be doing, then I would suggest you're a little bit legalistic. If it's all about, don't do that. Oh, did you do that? Then it's a bit legalistic. Do you know what you're supposed to do on the Sabbath? What are you supposed to do on the Sabbath? Remember, remember, you were once slaves in Egypt. And I brought you out by an outstretched arm and a mighty hand. Therefore, this is Deuteronomy chapter 5, therefore I have commanded you to keep the Sabbath. It's all about remembering what he's done for us. It's a day to remember. And that's why the commandment says don't wait. He wants us to rest. He wants us to rest. He wants us to cease from our labours. And he means that in a practical sense. But the reason he's saying all that to us is because he wants us to understand the gospel. It's a gospel message, the Sabbath's a gospel message that we are not saved by works. And that's what, again, when you read Hebrews 3 and 4, that's what it's explaining to you. Whoever has ceased from his works has entered his rest. And that's not talking about one day of the week. That's talking about eternity. That's talking about you've entered salvation. And you've understood that this is not about my works. And I'm going to just sit and rest. And that's a great thing to do on the Sabbath. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I, I'm also happy to see you What is? What is? If he's not brother. What? <laughs> it really took much of Egypt. All Egypt is the world. Yeah. He took it out of the world. That's right. People yeah. Will die. Love not the world. That's right. You don't right. want to know God. You don't want to know what he's done. Yeah. Son, That's right. Amen. Ah, Presentation of our Egypt. You know what I mean? Yeah. The Sabbath's a great day to remember yes. these things. Yes. And it's as I say, it's. It's not about, don't do that, don't do that. And it is, you know, don't wait, don't buy and sell. That's what it says. But it's all to bring us into the understanding that the work is done, you know. It is finished and there is nothing you can do to earn this. Just sit, sit, 
It's a Melchizedek message of Amen. the priesthood yes, sure. that we're part of now is seated in heavenly places Amen. and we are seated in him and that's all about entering his rest and from that position of rest he will equip us he will equip us to go out and do the works that he's called us to do only when you realize that you're not doing it to be saved if you're doing it to be saved you're legalistic and it's going to end in tears so you've got to start with this position of rest and let him empower you Amen. to do the works that he's called you yes. to do. And that's what we pray for everyone Amen. here. That we would know your will, Father. Yes. And that on this Sabbath, we would learn the Sabbath. Amen. And learn Amen. how to keep the Sabbath Amen. better, better, from glory to glory. Help us, but help us to know what to do. Which is to remember that you brought us out. by yes. your outstretched arm and your mighty hand. Amen. And it's a day separated to come to him as well. That's right. Six days you shall labour and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath. And again, a lot of people like to say, well, I just make, I have Wednesday as the Sabbath. It's like, well, Sabbath means seven. That's right. It's like, it's, it's in the name, Sabbath, it's all right, it's pointing to the seventh day of the week. Because he worked for six days, and on the seventh day, he finished everything, and on the seventh day, he rested, and he was refreshed, it says. So you can't make... Pick the day that you want to be the Sabbath. The Sabbath and the is Sabbath the Sunday is the first day. It's not Sunday is the first day. Sunday's the first day yeah. of the week, and it's Sunday yeah. is the first day of the week, and the first day of the week is a fantastic day. Yeah. I love the first day yeah. of the week. The first day of the week is when Yeshua ascended oh, yeah. to the Father. Mm. You know, this is the first day of the week. It's a wonderful day. You can't make it the Sabbath. And this is the, what the Roman Catholic Church did, didn't he? The Roman Catholic Church, Constantine, enacted this law and said, from now on, no one must rest on the Sabbath. From now on, everyone must worship on the venerable day of the sun. I mean, this is it's a bit obvious, isn't it? But we meet, I love Sunday. I love our house group on the first day of the week and we do the Gospels. It's fantastic. Not pagan about it at all. The Sabbath, the Sabbath. And keep it that way. And we're running out of time already, and I want to, we haven't even started, but let's just crack on. So the seventh day is the Sabbath of Yahweh Elohim, and you shall do no work, not your son, your daughter, your male servant, your female servant, or your cattle, or the stranger is within your gates. For in six days Yahweh made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, then he rested the seventh day. Therefore, Yahweh Bless the Sabbath day and hallowed it. I don't know why you find strange with this churchianity stuff. When Yeshua says quite clearly, I am the Lord of the Sabbath. What more reason would you want to keep the Sabbath than that? You know, when Jesus, your Saviour, says, I'm the Lord of the Sabbath, that should put the Sabbath more on the map than anything ever has. We should put the Sabbath more than the Jews. Because our Saviour says, I'm the Lord of the Sabbath. It's the Lord's day. Yeah. The Sabbath is the Lord's day. And it's so uh, prophetic because, isn't it, we understand on the few was here that we are, have now been through 6,000 years of history. Yeah. 6,000 years since yeah. the creation yeah. of the yeah. world. Yeah. And we know that it says that with the Lord, a day is as a thousand years. Yeah. Yeah. And so we are coming up now to the seventh day, which is going to be the millennium reign yeah. of Yeshua yeah. the Messiah. That's the Lord's day. That's the Lord's day. And that's what the Sabbath is pointing to. And that's why Paul says in Colossians chapter 2, don't let anyone judge you about keeping these feasts and about keeping these Sabbaths. These are, are, present tense, are, still are, shadow of things to come. The Messiah is the substance. So all this points to the Messiah. Not surprised the devil wants us to drop all this. Chapter verse 12, you can read that bit of so let's quickly. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long upon the land which Yahovah and your Elohim has given to you. You shall not murder. You shall not hate your brother. That means Yeshua said, murder is hating your brother in your heart. That's murder. You shall not commit adultery. That's looking at another woman or a male, you know, whichever way, with lust in your heart. That's adultery. Even if you just look. You shall not steal. 
You shall not bear false witness against your neighbour. You shall not covet your neighbour's house, nor shall you covet your neighbour's wife, or his male servants, or his female servants, or his docks, or his donkey, or anything that is your neighbour's. And that's how, when the Catholics have removed and repented, have removed one of the commandments, you just split that last one into two. Well, you should be splitting it into about five, really. No, don't cover your neighbour's house, don't cover your neighbour's wife. You know, so on. that's just how I've got rid of the first one. But this is where I want to get to tonight. Chapter 8, verse 18. Now, all the people witnessed, so in 10 minutes we'll get through this, so. All the people witnessed the thunderings, the lightning flashes, the sound of the shofar, and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they trembled and stood afar off. Then they said to Moshe, you speak with us and we will listen to you, but don't let God speak with us, because we will die. And Moshe said to the people, don't fear, don't fear, for God, this is a terrible translation as I am led to believe, and as I started to research it, I do believe. This is a terrible translation. It says, do, do not fear, for God has come to test you. Bad translation. God has come, really, to do a miraculous way in you, is what Moses is trying to say here. Don't fear, don't fear, don't stand afar off, don't resist this now. Just because you're scared and the mountain's trembling and there's fire and shofars, don't be scared. No, don't be afraid. Yahovah has come to perform a miraculous work in you. This is what Moshe is trying to say to them. So that, look at this, that his fear may be in you, may be before you, so that you may not sin. This is what God wants to do here. The purpose of this encounter here is that a miraculous change of heart would take place in the people and that then they would not sin. This is the new covenant, you know. This is, should be in this. If you're familiar with your Bibles, you should be familiar now with this language. This is the language that John is using in 1 John. And he says, little children, I am writing this to you so that you may not sin. Same language as this. He says later on, those who are born of God cannot sin. Cannot sin. That's what it says. Talking about our new spirit, our new heart doesn't sin. Doesn't want to sin. Our flesh wants to sin. Within about 24 hours a day, we've said this, the flesh wages war against the spirit. That's what goes on. But our spirits now, our inner man, our new hearts, perfect. It's the mind that needs renewing. Yeah, we need to renew our minds, that's right. But what Moses is saying here, the intention of God here, was to do a miraculous work in the people. But they resisted it. And that's where, for 10 minutes now, let's just finish off in the New Testament. Let me just finish that verse off. And that verse was Exodus 20, 20. That's easy to remember. It's like 2020 vision. This is the perspective you need to understand this verse. Though Moshe said to the people, do not fear, God has come. God has come to do a miraculous work in you. And that is fear may be before you so that you may not sin. So the people stood afar off. This is a disaster. Please, this is a disaster. The people stood afar off, but Moshe drew near the thick darkness where God was. So there's only a few verses left tonight, and we'll pick up on them next week. Now I'm going to spend 10 minutes in the New Testament just to read these scriptures out here. And it hasn't gone the way I wanted it to go tonight. Already spent a lot of time. I can't help. So let's start off this little next last little bit in Galatians. And you might not understand this on first reading. At first reading, you might not understand this. But I hope that this grabs you. I hope that this gets hold of you and draws you in personally, one on one, to understand what this script is on about. To really investigate and pray one on one, get before the Father and say, Father. Please don't make me understand this. I hope you will understand it right now. 
I'm understanding it more and more. Each time I read it, I get more and more out of it. And the whole week for me has been about investigating this. So in the weeks to come, you'll be hearing a lot more about this now, about this new covenant and how it compares with this Sinai experience. But the point I want to to understand, and it's only going to be five or ten minutes at the most now, Galatians chapter 4. Galatians chapter 4, verse 21. Galatians chapter 4, verse 21. Tell me, you desire to be under the law. Don't you hear the law? Don't those that want to be under the law, don't you even understand what the Torah is saying? Look what it says. For it's written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondwoman, the other by a feeble. But he who was of the bondwoman was born according to the flesh. 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 And he of the free woman through promise. And that is something we understand, don't we? That we are the sons of promise. The gospel is based on promises made to Abraham. The gospel is the promise. So we are the sons of promise. And verse 24 says, these things are symbolic. For these are the two covenants. Two covenants. That's what it says. These are the two covenants. The one from Mount Sinai. That's where we are tonight. Mount Sinai. The one from Mount Sinai which gives birth to bondage. Which is Hagar, the bond woman. Remember, Abraham had two sons, one by the bond woman, one by the free woman. The little Sinai represents bondage, which is Hagar. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai. And you know what? This is where Constantine's mum should have spent more time. If Constantine's mum would have read Galatians, she wouldn't have gone to the Sinai Peninsula and, and uh, proclaimed some obscure random mountain to be Mount Sinai. She doesn't want to stood on all Mount Sinai's in Arabia. But this is what happens when you don't read your Bible. This is where error comes from. Even geographical error comes from not reading your Bible. But Paul's quite clearly says, Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. And Paul would know that because he went there, didn't he? Yeah. And corresponds with this though, and corresponds this Hagar, this Mount Sinai, this covenant of bondage, represents, corresponds to Jerusalem. Which now is, and it's in bondage with atheism. But the Jerusalem above is free. Which is the mother of us all. The Jerusalem above is the mother of us all. And then he goes on to explain what he's all about and refers back to. Uh, uh, to Isaiah 54, the famous Isaiah 54, for it is written, Rejoice, so barren, you who did not bear, break forth and shout, you who are not in labour. For the desolate has many more children than she who has a husband. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are children of promise. So he's telling us here, Mount Sinai, be very careful with Mount Sinai. It's a, it's a bondage, it's a covenant of Bond as it says there, doesn't it? That's what it says, isn't it? I mean, that's, that's just what it says. Mount Sinai is corresponds to Jerusalem, which now is and is in bondage with their children. Why so? Why so? Don't blame God and don't blame the commandments. It's not to do with God and the commandments. It's everything to do with the people. Yeah. It's everything to do with the people, as Hebrews chapter 12 will now show us. You can't read Galatians 4 without he reading Hebrews 12. Hebrews 12 will show you quite clearly and maybe even will correct some of us if, if we've got some, something going on wrong. Maybe this will reveal why. Verse 18 of Hebrews 12 says this. You have not come to the mountain that may be touched and that burnt with fire and to blackness and darkness and tempest. That's why I've read every word of it tonight and emphasised a lot of them phrases because you'll see them all again now. And the writer of Hebrews, whoever it is, is saying quite clearly, you have not come to that mountain. Verse 19, and the sound of a shofar and the voice of words so that those who heard it begged, begged, they begged Moses that the word should not be spoken to them anymore. For they could not endure what was commanded. 
and when we want to direct this space, if so much as a beast touches that mountain, it shall be stoned or shot with an arrow. And so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I am exceedingly afraid and trembling. Well, we have not come to that mountain. That's what the scripture says anyway. Verse 22, but you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God. That's what Paul was saying, wasn't it? There's two Jerusalems here. There's an earthly Jerusalem and there's a heavenly Jerusalem. The earthly Jerusalem is in bondage. It's Mount Zion. There's a heavenly Jerusalem and a mountain called Mount Zion. That's where you have come to. And Mount Zion isn't a tallest mountain. Mount Zion's not going, oh, it's all done away with now. Mount Zion hasn't changed the calendar. Mount Zion hasn't changed the Sabbath to the first day of the week or any day that you choose. Mount Zion hasn't done that. And we'll prove it. So we have to just stick with us. You've come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels. To the, mine's horrible translation, George is good. What's yours saying now, George? Well, to millions of, to, yeah. to millions of angels in festive assembly. To the festive assembly. Mine says the, if anyone says the general assembly, that's horrible. Sounds like you're going to the transport and general workers union conference. <laughs> and Arthur Scargill's going to be there, telling you all to go out on strike. Oh, to the general assembly, to the, George says the festive assembly. That's what this assembly is. We are a festive assembly. We love the feasts of God. The feasts of Yahweh. That's what this is. Mount Zion hasn't done away with the feasts. We've come to the festive assembly and to the, to the, to the congregation of the firstborn. It says festal gathering. Festal gathering. That's beautiful. That's what we've come to. We're a festive people and we've come to the festal gathering and the assembly of the firstborn who are registered in heaven. That's what Yeshua said. Don't rejoice that demons are subject to you. Rejoice that your names are recorded in the book of life. Amen. Don't rejoice that your names are recorded in heaven. Amen. We come to the God, the judge of all, to the spirits of just when they perfect to Yeshua, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. Now here's the point. Here's the point. Verse 25. See that you, you, that have come to Mount Zion, see that you do not refuse him who speaks. For if they did not escape, who refused him? So you can see what it's saying there, can't you? They refused him. When they said to Moses, Moses, you go and talk to him, will you? Yeah. We don't want to hear his voice. His voice will kill us. If you read Deuteronomy chapter 7, you get Moses' version of it. Moses piece of it all and you get a little bit, bit more insight when Moses is relaying how the people came to him and said don't let us hear this voice it's, it's going to kill us this voice you go and speak to him Moses you go and speak to him it's a disaster because they refused him they refused a one on one face to face encounter with the living God just like a lot of churchianity is a lot of churchianity is that a lot of people think they'll be able to hide behind their pastor. And, and you sure it'll be like that. You can't hide behind your pastor, mate. <laughs> I'll deal with your pastor later. But right now, it's between me and you. And why do you call me Lord, Lord? Well, you don't even do what I say. Why do you call me Lord? If you don't do what I've said to do. This is what this is saying now. See, make sure that you don't refuse him who speaks for the day did not escape who refused him, who spoke on earth. Much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him who speaks from heaven, whose voice then shook the earth. That's why I mentioned them trembling mountains. His voice shook the earth. <coughs> but now once more, now he is promised saying, yet yeah, once more I'll see not only the earth, but also heaven. Yet now this yet once more indicates the removal of those things that are being shaken as of things that are made, that the things which cannot be shaken may remain. What can't be shaken? What did we read before? 
those who trust in Yahovah yeah. are like Mount Zion oh, yeah. who is established and firm. Th th those who come to Mount Zion and hear his voice will be having the same experience that the children of Israel had. Only now, God can do that miraculous service <coughs> because we are now part of the new covenant. Not that the covenant's changed, not that. The words have changed. It's the same voice. Can't you see that in Hebrews 12? It's the same voice. The same voice is speaking. God hasn't changed. He only says in a few verses later that Yeshua is the same yesterday, today and forever. The voice hasn't changed. The covenant hasn't changed. All that's changed now is where that's written. It's not written on tablets of stone anymore. It's written on your heart now. The covenant has not changed. The new covenant has not changed. It's just where it's written has changed. So I'm going to finish off now with a final scripture, which should... Let me just finish off that Hebrews one. There's only one or two verses to finish off there. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace. There's grace. This is what grace is for. This is the, what you want grace for. Grace by which we may serve God acceptably and with reverence, reverence and godly fear. For our God, you know, the God of the New Testament is a consuming fire. Just like the God that was at Mount Sinai and bears it all. It's the same God. But now he speaks from heaven. And he speaks of better things than the blood of Abel, it's saying. He speaks of reconciliation. So God help those people that refuse to hear this voice. Mm -hmm. This is all about Mount Zion, isn't it? That's clear, isn't it? From Galatians 4 and Hebrews 12. It should be clear. There's two covenants talking about here. One's Mount Sinai, which is bondage. Not because of God, but because of the people. The people that wouldn't hear it. And the people that made for themselves a golden calf. And broke that covenant. And then entered into a, Le a Levitical priesthood yeah. system and then were no longer a nation of priests yeah. but then they became a nation with a tribe of priests mm -hmm. not God's plan as we'll see in Romans 3 it's so clear when God says from now on you're going to have a Levitical priesthood but this was not my plan when I brought you out of Egypt when I brought you out of Egypt my plan was all the first form will be the priests but now now you are going to have a Levitical priesthood, which we'll discuss in time to come and next week, which Galatians will explain to us, is a prosthetic limb added, added because of sin. It cannot change the covenants. It cannot annul the promises. We read that a few weeks ago. We read it more. But it was to get us through. That's what happened. So final scripture of the night is Isaiah chapter 2. And you better love this one. <coughs> Yeah. There's one we need to point out is those Christians that go to church that say, but God's a loving God, he wouldn't send anyone to um, well, that's what I think happens to the ET, 12. Yeah, I'm not saying you don't stand in one go, like, what's it mean? What's it mean? We haven't come to that mountain. It's like, all you can do is abide in this and challenge it. And if, if, if you don't like what I'm saying, that, that, that's how God, you know, I learn a lot through error. I learn a lot through other people's error. I got that, haven't I? I am up for challenge. Yeah. I am. You've stopped no one ever bothers to come out. I haven't talked to me, but you know, I'm always sitting there. If you ever want to come and challenge anything, please. Yeah, I'm just, you know. Yeah, I think it's a good time to go and tell about their love as well, because it's better than it's in a part. It's bigger than shaking, doesn't it? Yeah. You can't have a shake there, yeah. Yeah. So I want, I want you to just know now what to expect from this Mount Zion. I've made the case tonight that we, I've made the case, the Bible makes the case. That all oh, we're reading the Torah portion, it's all about Mount Sinai. The Holy Spirit, the Father, wants us to divert our attention from Sinai because we haven't come there. What's the point going there? We haven't come there. We want to get our attention off Sinai onto Zion. Zion, Zion. Sound like Bob Marley. Chapter 2 of Isaiah. Chapter 2 of Isaiah. Chapter 2 of Isaiah. We need to understand this. Now it shall come to pass, verse 2, chapter 2, verse 2. It shall come to pass. So let God be true and every man a liar. You know, no matter what anyone in the world thinks, God's going to make this happen. It shall come to pass. Well, in the latter days, 
that the mountain of Yahovah's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and he shall be exalted above the hills and all nations who loves that? I like a few people love that then. I get to feel it. Let's say it again. Because it's prophetic this as well. You know, we're, we're involved in prophecy here. Yeah? And we are getting the opportunity, whoever joins in now, to proclaim the word of Yah. All nations shall flow to it. Many people shall come and say, and we're part of that group. We even sing songs like this. I think you were singing at the start. Many people will come and say, Come, bow, and let us go to the mountain of Yahovah, to the house of the God of Jacob. Well, just remind me, when is this going to happen? In the latter days. In the latter days. And it's starting to happen now. It's, you've even got a gang of scousers and other nationalities and whatever you call it. It was seven. We were getting together on the Sabbath. We were trying to understand the Torah. We were going, I don't agree with that. Grace, let's work this out. Let's reason together. We want the truth there. We want the truth. Please sanctify us by your truth. Please deliver us from error and bring us into your glorious truth. You should have prayed in John 17. Sanctify them, Father, by your truth. Your word is truth. So this, let's just finish off this verse. So many people are going to say this. Let's go up to the house of Yah, to the mountain of Yahuwah, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways and we shall walk in his paths. Because look at this. This is where you've come. For out of Zion shall go forth the Torah. How clear is that? In the latter days, many from all the nations shall come and say, you know what, I've had enough of that nonsense in the age. I've had enough of that pagan rubbish telling me that God's changed his mind. I've had enough. I want to worship the true God. This is the language Yeshua was using with the woman at the well in Samaria. And what did he say to her? The day is coming up when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will people worship because God looking for people to worship him in spirit and truth and that's all in a reference to Mount Zion okay. to Mount Zion which is a physical mountain but it's much more than that it's a spiritual mountain and out of Zion shall go forth and tore it so I hope you can understand that but I don't expect you to grasp everything just please consider these things now because we're in that portion now next week is just a continuation you know next week just continues the divine flow of speech from the creator of the universe telling us how to be the holy nation how to be his special people and his his kingdom of priests it's going to continue next week so, yeah. sorry that first four of us uh... He shall judge between the nations and shall decide disputes between the people. Yeah. And they shall beat the sword. So it's not like Moses, like he's going to do it, it's God and God Amen, Amen well the Messiah is, is a prophet like Moses isn't he? Yeah. Moses is yeah. I see that as Yeshua of course it is because after the tribulation 